uh, we can start this uh, webinar. Uh, it is organized by the you know GSS standard for observation technical committee. Uh, today, Chichar uh, uh, Nathan is is giving this uh, very interesting seminar. Uh, before that, I want to introduce Richard. He pursued studies at the University of Texas, receiving a doctoral degree in electrical engineering in uh, 2010. He is a distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. He is on temporary assignment as a scientist with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, where he managed several SAR collaboration efforts, including open source SAR toolbox and SAR data standards. He, ha he has five patents in the fields of radar and digital communication systems. And he has authored several publications on radar and signal processing. So now it's your turn, Richard. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you all this morning about the efforts that we have going on in P4002, this uh, SAR metadata content standard uh, working group for, uh, for GRSS. And so uh, today in this talk, I'm going to first start with a very brief introduction to, to SAR and show some example SAR imagery, uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, prime, uh, to explain what we're, we're trying to achieve. I think a little bit of that background is helpful when we go and we talk about the standards themselves. Then I'm going to cover a bit of the P4002 background, uh, where it fits in terms of uh, other international efforts and other standards efforts related to SAR. And um, then I'm going to go through a couple of use cases and requirements to talk about, you know, some of the specific things that we have to consider when we're working with SAR uh, metadata. And, um, you know, these, I think these use cases will really inform uh, some of the, the things that we have to worry about as we develop this standard and how that, that impacts interoperability and uh, products that you can form with SAR. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the P4002 development process, you know, how we, we manage this standards committee uh, this effort. And, you know, I, I think we have some lessons learned that might be useful for other individuals that are involved with, with other IEEE standard efforts. And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll get to your questions. And um, so, so look forward to that. All right. So, so what is synthetic aperture radar? Um, you know, it's, it's an imaging technique uh, based on the radio reflectivity of, of um, objects in the scene. And Initially, it, will, it would look um, like it's, it's produced similar to, to um, or the images that are produced look similar to those produced by electro-optical sensors. But the phenomenology behind, uh, you know, the process that produces these sensors is very different. To begin with, SAR is an active sensor. It provides its own illumination, and it measures uh, the radio frequency reflectivity, uh, and, and it's, it's sending out that, that RF energy, and then it's getting reflected back. Uh, the other thing that's different is typically with an, uh, you know, an, a, um, an optical camera, you're, you're, you have a, a frame and, and objects from a scene are projected through a series of lenses onto some frame and that frame is captured. And you know, either at once or in a short duration of time, with SAR, images are formed over the course of an aperture. And we typically call this the coherent processing interval. And throughout this time, the sensor is moving. And that is because it needs to move to synthesize uh, this, this virtual antenna that's much larger than the physical antenna of the sensor. And that motion um, you know, really complicates the metadata associated with these products because you, you make some assumptions about ideal motion to form the image, but those might not be correct based on how um, you're using that data later. And really being able to go back and look at, at how that exactly happened can be really important. And we'll, and we'll go through some examples of that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about SAR is we, we typically refer to range and, and cross range or range and azimuth, uh, is, you know, these two cardinal dimensions in the image. And the, the way that objects are resolved in range and cross range are very different. Um, in range resolution, we resolve objects by transmitted bandwidth. Um, but in ad, azimuth, it's, it's through this subtended angle. It's through the motion of the, the sensor over the course of that CPI. And... Um, and so that, that ends up being really important for metadata as well. And the other thing that's interesting about, about SAR is we, we display these things as a, as a 2D image. Um, but in reality, we're collecting measurements of, of ISO range and ISO Doppler. And so essentially from your sensor to an object uh, you know, that's being imaged in the scene, you have a measurement 
of um, of iso range, which is basically some position on a on a sphere, and then iso Doppler, which is a a position on a cone. If you take the intersection of those two, you get a ring. Um, well, we need to actually map that to a single point in in space to form an image. And so the way that's done is is we have an image uh, surface that we pick and we find the intersection. Um, but if you're using this data and there's actually some terrain variation, then that might not be a valid assumption, you know, assuming this flat plane. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, but it's, I guess the, the big point here is that even though it looks like an image and we're, we're you know, we're used to looking and dealing with images from, uh, from optical sensors, it, the, the physical um, process is very different. And so here's an example of, of an image. Um, this one is, was, was captured by an, an airborne sensor um, and so, you know, I work at Sandia, this is one of our, our sensors, and here you see an optical image in the left and a, kind of a zoom on, on the right of a building, and uh, you see the, the SAR product in the middle. And, um, you know, it's black and white because what we're seeing here is, is a mapping of reflectivity onto a color bar. And uh, you'll notice that the building is slightly distorted, right? It's, it's squished um, because we're measuring that, that range and, and objects with height are, are laid over slightly. Uh, the other thing to notice about SAR is the, the specular nature of the return, right? There is there is the speckle noise, um, which occurs in these pixels. And um, then the shadows. And here the shadows, because we provide our own illumination, the shadows that you see are not based on uh, the sun, right? Illumination from an external source. That's actually shadowing of the SAR sensor itself. So if I move forward, here's an example uh, from, from Umbra. So this is a, a spaceborne system. Um, this is uh, an airport in Thailand. And this is part of the Umbra open data set. And so, you know, a number of the, of the commercial SAR vendors have, have websites where they share a portion of their library uh, for, for folks to, to go and um, experiment. And so this is a, an example of, of one of these images that's available and it's, it's um, just open access, you can get it uh, with a Creative Commons license. And they have a whole stack of, of images uh, from, from this airport over time, and also a number of other scenes uh, around the world. And again, this is, um, this is an example from Umbra, but, but you can find similar things from, from some of the other commercial vendors like ISI and, and Capella. All right, so the other thing I wanted to touch upon is the the process to form these images, you know, it's, it's complex and there's a lot of engineering subdisciplines that are involved. And so certainly there's this, because it's RF um, and you're, you're synthesizing it, you're, you're generating it yourself and sending it out. There's a lot of work in electromagnetics and intended design. I'm also looking at propagation, um, but because the sensor is moving, then there's also a, a, an aerospace component, um, either if it's on an airborne platform or on a satellite, uh, knowing about inertial measurement and, and how that uh, platform is moving is really important. Uh, then displaying these images, again, because they, they, they look like an optical image, but they're not quite, you know, it, it really is important to understand the human interface design. And then, you know, of course, this is my background is in signal processing. There's a ton of signal processing that's involved uh, in, in these efforts. And it's, it's very compute intensive as well. And so, Every SAR image is an approximation of a match filter. And the match filter process could be fairly straightforward, but, but computationally it's, it's um, burdensome. You, you can't really perform it um, realistically for, for SAR scenes, it would be too expensive. And so taking careful approximations is required to form a SAR scene in a computationally achievable fashion. And those approximations factor into the SAR metadata as well. So anyway, that's a little bit of background and motivation, hopefully for our, our process. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is, is what a typical SAR processing chain looks like. And so, you know, the first thing that happens is data is collected from a SAR sensor, it's downlinked. And, and then um, that data, which is typically, it, it, you know, the, the raw data is, is often compressed or vector quantized. It has a lot of um, things that are very specific to that sensor. So typically that is taken and from it, you produce a, a face history product, which is a little bit more standardized. And that would be IQ samples um, taken at the antenna, you know, for a pulse. And then these, these pulses are, are collected over time. 
And so you'd have that in associated metadata, and that would be a standardized um, IQ product. Well, that still requires a lot of knowledge about the specifics of how it was collected. And so typically, if, if you're uh, just a researcher and you want to utilize this data for some scientific application, you're not that interested in having to understand all of the nuances of the, of the um, particular sensor platform itself. And so the next stage is after you perform this process of image formation. And like I said, that's a that's an approximation of a match filter um, for computational uh, purposes. Then you end up with a complex SAR image and metadata. So each pixel, you still have a magnitude and a phase. So you can measure the phase response um, because it is RF. And so you're at a stage where most of the heavy lifting has been done. The, the product is, is readily um, usable for, for future scientific work, but um, you know, you don't have to worry about all of the complexities of, of the image formation process and all the specifics of the sensor that collected it. So it's a really uh, nice point in, in time uh, for, you know, something to, to, be, um, to be utilized. And so that is why, that is where we are focusing the P4002 effort on what we call a single look complex. So a, a single SAR collect complex image. And, um, you know, that's, that's the focus of this effort. You know, certainly there's there's um, data layers before that that are more raw, and there's data layers after that that are more processed. But for, for the first effort of the IEEE uh, GRSS, you know, putting out a SAR standard, this point here is really a nice kind of median be between those two. And so now that I've, I've given a little bit of background uh, to, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve, I'd like to talk a little bit about where uh, P4002 fits in in the broader SAR, or I'm sorry, the, the broader IEEE ecosystem. And so IEEE has a, a standards association that manages all of the IEEE standards, and it has a number of committees. Um, you know, I have, I have them listed here, but um, the Audit Committee, New Standards Committee, and Standards Review Committee, and they manage the entire standards process. And so obviously NESCOM looks at proposed standards and they decide, does this really fit with the IEEE mission? Is it within scope of IEEE? Are the right people represented? Is it something we should move forward with? Um, once that happens, then the Standards Review Committee recommends approval or disapproval. You know, when a standards group like P4002 forms a standard, you know, they, they give a, an up and down recommendation to the Standards um, Association Board. And then there's an audit committee, which is making sure that you're following the right process the whole way through, right? That, that um, everyone, everyone's voice is getting fully represented. There's no undue influence on the process. And so, you know, we um, are, you know, are obviously working with the standards association and following their process for the formation of this, of this uh, new standard. Now, um, you know, I think you're all probably familiar with GRSS because we're here at its, at its webinar, but that is a sensing society, a society in IEEE that is really focused on, on both earth science and then how you utilize remote sensing uh, to, to perform that, that, that earth sciences. And so GRSS has a standards committee as a, you know, a subcommittee under the society. And um, it also you know, will stand up technical committees to promote advances in areas of member technical interest. And so GRSS, I think has currently eight technical committees. One of these technical committees is the GRSS standards for Earth observations, and so this was started, you know, I think circa 2017, to, to really promote um, standards, you know, uh, to, related to generation, distribution, and utilization of remote sensing products. And so they look for areas where a standard could improve remote sensing, and then you know engage members in GRSS to to uh, work on on working this, you know, both both. Uh, working towards a new standard, and also uh, to, to to adopt a standard once it's finished, and then uh, things like education and outreach. So so like this webinar, um, but there are there are five working groups that are currently sponsored by GRSS GRSS SC the Standards Committee, and initiated within the Standards Association um, that have been part of this uh, uh, GSEO initiative. And so those are, are hyperspectral um, SAR, which is this effort, 
the GNSSR, uh, soil spectroscopy, and RFI and remote sensing. And so that's that's kind of where we fit in this broader effort. I will mention that um, one of the things that, that technical committees do is they sponsor committee meetings at IGARS. Those, those meetings are open to all participants. And so there will be a, a committee meeting um, for the uh, GSEO at, at IGARS, and, and hopefully you'll see more uh, P4002 content there. So anyway, that's just a little bit of background about where we fit in in the broader, uh, broader ecosystem. And so I'll mention you know, this, uh, the P4002, we had our first meeting in, uh, in June of 2018. So we've been going on for about six years. I've been involved uh, for a little over a year. You know, I'm, I'm currently the chair of the committee, but I do want to point out that there's a lot of work that led to this uh, state that we're in now um, before I, I joined. And so I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Wade Schwarzkopf and Dr. Leland Pierce and then all the other folks that have participated. To date, we've had about 50 people who have participated in the process and um, you know, done some really great work. And we're nearing uh, the point where we can submit our first draft. But um, now that I've, I've kind of covered what P4002 is, I'd like to talk a little bit about other SAR related standards. And so the, the, um, the first, the earliest SAR metadata format was from the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and that was in 1988. It targeted spaceborne collectors. And um, while it was widely adopted, it ended up having limited um, impact on interoperability because um, the sensor specific formats that were adopted, you know, were rendered incompatible. They all had to have sensor specific e extensions. And so once you added on those extensions, then the workflows that utilize those products uh, ended up being somewhat proprietary. Um, there's also a number of ISO standards that are related to, uh, you know, geo, um, remote sensing in general, but also uh, including SAR. So I have these listed here, um, but they're somewhat incomplete. And then, um, you know, the, the last set that I'll mention are, are three standards that are uh, from the US National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And so these are actually ones that I'm involved with as well in my, my day job. Um, so compensated face history data, which is that raw, you know, that IQ data prior to image formation, sensor independent complex data, which is a single look complex product. And then uh, sensor independent derived data, which is taking that complex image product and forming a detected image. And so that middle one, the sensor independent complex data, that is really the closest to what we're trying to do with this P4002 metadata effort. Um, so there are a number of things that, that we can borrow from SICID. There are also some issues with, with um, th that standard as is for adoption of P4002 that we need to address. And so the benefits of SICID are that it fully describes the image data, right? That's an issue with, with um, the ISO standards. They, they don't fully describe the image data. It has support both for the image domain and also the spatial uh, frequency domain, which I'll talk about in a minute. It uh, describes the collection timeline. So it describes that CPI and how things are collected over time. And it provides reference coordinate systems for both transmit and receive face centers, along with an effective aperture reference point. And so, um, you know, this is important because especially in the, in the case with a satellite, the, uh, the sensor is moving along, you know, uh, let's say at 5,000 kilometers in elevation. And so it transmits a pulse. Uh, in fact, it, it's going to probably be transmitting a number of pulses in a row before that first pulse hits the ground and comes back. So, you know, you, you might have a dozen or two dozen pulses in the air prior to the return. And so the sensor has moved quite a bit during that time. And when you're forming an image, um, you have to keep track of both where the transmit point was, the receive point, and then kind of the effective point as if um, the sensor was stationary during that pulse. So it covers all of that. It's, it's all in there. Now, the limitations with SIGID is it only supports a single burst. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, what that means in a, in a minute. Uh, but it also only supports a single channel. And so things like polymetric SAR, which we will, we will discuss, uh, that's not included. Um, you know, it only supports a single polarization. Another major issue with, with SICID is it is tied to a specific encoding on disk. And so a SICID file is a set of XML meta metadata and then binary data in, in, a, in a file. 
And so it is dictating how data is written to disk. And for this effort, we don't want to do that. We want to say, okay, here's a set of metadata. You can encode it and you can put it to disk however you'd like. Um, now, the, the other issue is, is there are some incompatibilities because you know, the sensors developed from NGA were really focused on their mission need. Um, and so there's some incompatibilities between them um, and the, uh, the ISO standard. Um, and so you know, that, that's really where it fits in. So we're going to adopt a number of things from SICID, modify them though, to, to really fit the needs of P4002. So you know, our, our overall requirements are describing the sensor collection acquisition of the data, you know, along with the collected modes and parameters, and then also describe the processing algorithms that have been applied. And what this will enable uh, is, is quite powerful. Um, you know, as I've talked about, SAR processing tools and, and, and the chain, processing chains involved are very complex and expensive to develop. Historically, they've been pipelined. Having a standardization would allow code reuse and amortization of cost. And so you'll see, you know, we have a number of kind of nascent open source efforts that have been moving forward that provide algorithms that can operate on SAR images. Um, but, but also for commercial products, if you're, if you're building a new product, you want it to be able to work with as many sensors as, as possible. So, so people can buy your product and, and, and use it without you having to spend a lot of time developing specific uh, kind of one-off uh, pieces of code for a particular sensor. The other thing is, is it allows encapsulation of complexity. And we're going to kind of go through this a bit more in some of the vignettes later, but um, this R process is very complex. And sometimes you have to dig into a specific part of that process and expose the complexity to do your processing. And, and sometimes you don't. And so having a standard allows you to ignore the complexity um, if you don't have to, to worry about it. And then in, in cases when you do, um, you're able to dig into specifically what happened, maybe the specific timeline in a, in a single pulse, um, you know, and how frequency versus time varied without having to know a lot about the details of the specific sensor. And uh, the other issue that we're seeing is just the number of, of sensors and applications are rapidly increasing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too, but um, we're seeing a shift from SAR being the domain of, of folks like myself who do it full time. Um, you know, I, I've been, been working in SAR for two decades now and it's all I do. But we're, we're seeing this exciting development where non-SAR experts are now able to get SAR collections and apply it to their own problems. And they're able to do it from a number of sensors, you know, and pull in all this disparate data and, and really do some exciting things. So it's, it's a great thing to happen to SAR, but also you know, the fact that more non-experts are getting pulled in really um, increases the need for a standard. So I think I've, I've talked about most of these things. The one thing that I will mention here is that there's a number of ways to form a SAR image. There's a number of ways basically to do that match filter, the, approxim or the approximation to a match filter to, to form an image product. And one of the big issues with, um, with SICKET as it is now is it only supports you know, three different um, image formation products. And what we'd like to do is kind of expand upon uh, the philosophy of, of the SICKET standard and provide exquisite support for any SAR imaging mode, image formation algorithm that we know about, but we don't want to restrict users to those specific sets of algorithms. And so basically we'll provide extended support for anything that we, we know and we understand, um, but still provide support, basic support for any new or arbitrary image formation algorithm that you might use. And so it's, it's really trying to encompass um, you know, the, the wide field of image formation algorithms, but still providing enhanced support uh, for those that we can. And, you know, right now in SICKET, I guess I'll mention that the, the, the three that are supported are just range and azimuth compression, polar format, and RMA. Um, especially with new users to SAR, one of the big form, uh, um, image formation products that they like to use is, is fast uh, vector, or vectorized back projection. And there is not good back projection support in SICKET. So, this has already been a big issue with wider adoption of, of that standard. 
And so here's kind of an example of, of the different bits of metadata that we need to include. Uh, so the first is really this description of the SAR data set. So that could be the, you know, the product type, the collect information, the scene information. Um, this also includes things like when the data was collected, did the sensor know about any other data that might be paired with it? And so, uh, for, you know, for SAR, you might want to take an image and come back a couple days later and take another image and then look at the difference, do a, do a change product. And so if you have knowledge of those change product um, sets existing, you could put that in the data set description as well. Obviously, there's you need to have phase and gain information. And for a lot of these systems, they're steerable and unsteerable components. And so you, you could have a dish, you could have a, an electronically steered array. So you need to be able to encapsulate that information in the metadata. Um, certainly information about polarization and then, uh, you know, what calibration you've done, how, how you've compensated that data for non-idealities of your antenna. The other thing is that all of those have to uh, be recorded versus time because throughout the course of the aperture, you might change, well, you will change where the antenna is pointing because the sensor is moving, but you also might change um, the electric steering components of that array that might change the calibration and, um, you, you also have to keep track of, of just how it's steered. And if you're on a spacecraft and the antenna is rotating, then your polarization vectors could also be rotating. So all of those things have to be encapsulated in, in this, uh, this file. Um, certainly, you know, the, the radar waveform is really important. And so bandwidth duration rates and windowing, um, but, but also things like if it's a complex uh, waveform, you know, step chirp or, or something like that, in, incorporating how exactly the frequency versus time varied. And, and I have some examples of that later. Um, so in, in SAR, we typically are concerned with both the image domain and the spatial frequency domain. And so the image domain is basically uh, the reflectivity on the ground. It's, it's like the example images I showed you earlier. But if you take the Fourier transform of that, you get the spatial uh, frequency domain. And we also have to be able to represent that. All right, and um, I think that basically covers it. I guess the other thing I'll mention is error statistics are really important and how those propagate through. Now, a, a little bit about this process. Um, you know, SAR is a really big field. And so, you know, e even folks like myself that are working with SAR day and night, um, we, um, you know, any individual is not going to cover the full breadth of the field. And there are certain areas, and a, a great example is polymetric calibration, where P4002, we had this core group of folks that were working on the standard. So I think I'd said, you know, over, over time, we've had 50 uh, people that have, have participated in, in at least one meeting. Um, generally, a meeting would be somewhere between eight and a dozen individuals, you know, kind of the core group. And, and that makeup has changed a little bit over time. Um, but we got to the point where we needed to do polymetric calibration and we really didn't have the expertise in the core group uh, to perform that. And so what we found is that if you could narrowly define the scope, um, there are domain experts that didn't have time to fully participate in the, the standards process you know, for a multi-year effort, but they were very happy to join and, and lead their expertise on a narrowly focused field. And so for polymetric calibration, we were able to benefit from a number of individuals that are very focused in that particular aspect of SAR. And so, you know, I, I think this is a great lesson for other standards groups. If you have narrowly defined needs and you need a you know, particular set of subject expertise, uh, you know, people are, are really generally happy to, to, to lend uh, their help. All right, so, so now I wanna go through, you know, some motivation for, for some of the specific pieces of metadata that we have and how this, um, you know, what, uh, what really motivates our, our, our process here. So on the left, you see a, um, a UAV mounted radar. Um, so here it's on a, a, a tiger shark. It's, it's a highly modified uh, mini SAR. Um, so this is a, a radar that's, a, you know, about 50 pounds. It's flying on a platform that's, that's fairly slow. Uh, it's fairly small. It has a close stand-in range, so it's it's maybe standing out ten kilometers. And uh, because it's flying low and slow, it is uh, subject to a lot of turbulence. And so this thing is bouncing around quite a bit as it's flying along. And your your flight path is really not ideal. Um, 
Now over on the right, you'll see Terrasardax and Tandemax satellites. And so these are exquisite se uh, sensors. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think they're at like 515 kilometers of altitude. And so they have really nice, uh, you know, they have a TLE, they're moving quite uh, smoothly over, over the collect. Um, however, their standoff range is, is quite far. And so, you know, they might, they might be, I don't know, seven or 800 kilometers from the site that they're imaging and you're imaging through the ionosphere. And so as RF travels through the ionosphere, um, it's bent, right? And so your, um, you don't have the same time return that you would in free space. You have this distortion uh, from the ionospheric effects. And so you have to keep track of that. And so these are, you know, examples of how the SAR signal will, would change throughout the course of collection, but very differently in these two different domains. And the metadata has to incorporate both of these scenarios. Now, the, the other thing I mentioned this before, but, you know, historically you have these SAR processing chains and they were pipelines. And you often would have an expert and they were, you know, used to using one uh, particular set of data. So for instance, in graduate school, I did a lot of processing of ERS-1 uh, data, right? And I had all of this data from that sensor. I had uh, processing chains that were very complex, but they were dedicated to that sensor. And, um, you know, that's what I did. So it was all, it was one pipeline for that sensor and the processing of that sensor's data. And that processing chain would look very different from a Terrasar or ERS versus a like a mini SAR, like the, the the small UAV example I showed. But uh, you know this is changing. Instead of having you know a, a you know a very small number of sensors globally, there are many dozens of civil and commercial SAR missions. A lot of this data is freely available to the public, or um, you know it's available to purchase for fairly low cost. It's rapidly growing. Um, I, I, you know, I think a good example of this is just this transporter launch a couple months ago. There were nine SAR satellites on that one launch vehicle. It's a pretty exciting time uh, to be in this field. And so this is all driving this shift from pipelines utilized by experts to you know, workflows where everyone, this uh, democratization of SAR data, so a really positive thing for the community, but everybody's using it and often using data from many sensors in their workflow. Now, the other thing that's changing is the bandwidths on these sensors are increasing, which, which is great because we get more range resolution. But historically, uh, for, for a couple of reasons, one, just because of limitations in electronics, um, but, but also because of limited bandwidth, radars normally transmitted a linear FM chirp. And so you'd start uh, at either your lower or upper frequency and just, just linearly increase frequency across the pulse. Well, with new systems, a lot of times the, the waveform is much more complex. And so here on the left here, you see an example of a step chirp. And so we need a way in the metadata to represent what is going on with a situation like that and um, you know, how that data is received. Because of course you're transmitting this waveform, it hits the scene. Uh, when it hits the scene, the waveform is, is convolved with, with um, the data in the scene and then it's, it's sent back. And so your, um, your transmit might be somewhat complex. Your received data is also somewhat complex. And so here you see a, a transmit example on the left, a received example on the right. And that's one of the things that we've really tried to do with this metadata is encapsulate these more complicated scenarios. Now here, um, you know, we already looked at this, but this is a, a typical processing chain. And, um, I'm showing this because I'm going to talk a little bit about how with certain applications in SAR, you need to be able to take a form product and then invert, you know, kind of back out some of the processing that's been done to get back to data that's a little bit more raw. So you understand kind of the phenomenology that's been abstracted away by the image formation process. And, um, you know, of course, one of the other benefits of, of standardization is that you could have pipelines that, that go through this stage of taking, um, you know, probably the, the raw data to the IQ metadata is going to be sensor specific. But once you get to that point, um, it, it's possible to have a number of different tool chains and, and you, you could mix them, right? And, and so form these standard products. And so your IQ uh, 
your complex SAR and your detected SAR can all be standards. And uh, then you could have algorithms that, that work on uh, data at any of those levels that are also standards and, and produce new products without having to worry about the complexities of the underlying sensor. And, and here, you know, again, earlier I talked about differences in collection modes. So historically, you know, especially if you look back at uh, the COS standard, that uh, was mostly strip map, you had the, these kind of two basic ways of collecting SAR data. Um, one strip map, you, you basically aim the antenna out the side of, of, the cent of the platform and you collect a strip. And so you're, you're basically doing what we call MOCOMP to a line. Your, your reference point for that antenna is a line that's moving in a linear fashion with the motion of the platform. The, the second way that these sensors would typically op operate is spotlight, where you're focusing on a single point in the ground. And as the platform moves, um, you know, it traverses through the CD, uh, the coherent processing interval, it is focusing on a single point. And um, th those two are pretty straightforward to it to incorporate in a standard. But that's not the world we live in anymore. And so, uh, you know, a lot of these new systems, they have exquisite capabilities, especially with um, electronic steering arrays. They can they can change their endpoint quite rapidly, and uh, that has led to the development of of really interesting imaging modes. And you know, imaging modes where you can do things like get high resolution, uh, but also cover a large area. And so here is kind of a notional scan SAR mode. Um, this is one example of a more complicated collection scenario. And each of these little colored squares represents a burst. And so you might end up with a product where it's not easily described as a single strip map or single spotlight collect. So that's, that's certainly, you know, that's one of the things that we've had to worry about in this standard as well. Like how do you represent a product, an image that is formed with, with multiple bursts? And so here's an example of what that metadata might look like. Um, this is, this is our, our, you know, in the current draft. And so here we see there's, there's um, two complex images from a scan mode collect. And uh, they're described by these bursts uh, with, with these polygons. And so this is just uh, an example of how, you know, earlier standards like um, the, the uh, COS wouldn't support something like this. And so we're really trying to incorporate uh, you know, advanced support for, for newer products. Now, uh, you know, again, I've kind of talked about this throughout the talk, but when you're imaging with SAR, uh, you have two measurements. Uh, fundamentally, like in any SAR image, it's going to be an ISO range sphere and an ISO Doppler cone. Now, uh, you might have additional measurements depending on the, on the system. You know, if it's a multiple a multiple uh, face center array, you might also have some some angle of arrival information. If it's polymetric collects, you might have information about the um, the scattering matrix, you know, in H and V. But fundamentally, all SAR systems will have at least these two fundamental measurements of ISO range and ISO Doppler. And you know, like I said, the, the intersection of these is going to be a, um, a cone. Um, well, we need a point to be able to geolocate a target. And so here on the right, you'll see what happens. You have this, uh, um, I'm sorry, not a, not a cone, but a ring. You have this ring and you intersect it with an image plane. Um, however, sometimes we want to go back and we want to we back that out. We want to go back to the range in Doppler and really understand how that was done. And so here's an example of, of why we might do that. And so in, in stereo SAR, you're able to take images that are collected from different uh, perspectives. Uh, you know, you have different geometry, and you're able to take those uh, those measurements. And instead of intersecting the 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 ring of a single image with an image plane, you intersect the two rings together, and you're able to get a height map. And so this is you know it's an interesting product if you want to pull pull out height information um, from images that are not coherent. And so this requires detailed information about geometry, timing, and um, you know that needs to be included in the metadata standard. And so this is an example of where you know you're moving beyond just just the image product. The other thing that's really important is that error statistics 
you know, air is generated at different stages of the, uh, of the formation process. A good example is there's going to be some unknown amount of, of extra range delay in your sensor. And there's also some uncertainty in the position of the platform. And, you know, that's probably much, uh, much less uncertainty for a, you know, a highly sophisticated calibrated satellite versus a UAV that's bouncing around. Uh, but either way, you need to understand what that error propagation is and how it's propagated through the system and, and the processing chain. And then that will lead to your final error bound on, on uh, for example, your stereo product. Now, um, you know, in, in, in SAR, uh, you know, again, uh, unlike an optical image, we're concerned with two domains. So we're concerned with both the image domain, which is our, our spatial reflectivity, and the Fourier transform dual, which is the spatial reflectivity domain or the wave number domain. And uh, kind of the first order, I'm, I'm glossing over some of the, of, uh, the complexities here, but um, when we collect a, a single pulse, it's gonna be like a line in the spatial frequency domain. And, and over time we build up you know, this annulus of, of collected pulses. And um, you need to have under, you know, fully understand both of these domains and, and have, you know, really rigorous coordinate systems as well as error bounds for advanced star processing. And an example of why this would be used is for interferometric SAR. And so, you know, earlier I showed stereo SAR where you can get height information from uh, SAR scenes that are collected with disparate geometry. Um, interferometric SAR lets you look at the phase difference between pixels in a SAR scene and back out um, height differences from a coherent product. And so these are basically um, two SAR collections that are offset very slightly in, in cross track. And, um, or, or, you know, with, with a, something like the, the shuttle tomographic mission, on the space shuttle, they had one radar antenna on the shuttle itself, and they had a boom, and they had another uh, antenna face center sitting like 50 feet off on this boom. And so, you know, just a slightly uh, offset and cross track, and you're able to form a product like this, where you look at the, the slight phase difference in the two, the two scenes, and you can form an interferogram. If this is done over multiple passes, then of course you can form a, a differential interferogram where you look at, at terrain change over time. So that's a really important um, product in earth sciences and something that, that we wanna support. Um, the other thing is that's looking at the phase of this complex pixel value. If you look at the magnitude of the complex pixel value and you just difference the, um, the magnitudes, then you end up with a product called a coherent change detection. Here you see an example where you can look at that to see what has changed in a scene. I mean, and here there's, there's tire tracks. Um, the other thing is you can do multiple CCD products over time and you can form something called a normalized change detection where you suppress changes that are, that are the same across a pair of, of, of change products and you're only left with um, the most recent change in a scene. So again, those are, those are three uh, example products that rely on uh, registration, both in the image domain, as well as the spatial frequency domain. And that is because we need these products to be coherent. And uh, SAR products are only coherent if their spatial frequency support overlaps. And, you know, for any image, just because of, of non-idealities in the collection, you, you know, you'll typically end up with spatial frequency domains that look like uh, this example on the right here, where there's a piece that overlaps, but there's this bit on the edge and you want to be able to identify the, that bit on the edge, you know, the spatial frequency support that doesn't overlap and trim it. Um, because if you don't trim it, you're adding noise to your product. And, uh, you know, we don't want that. So this is, you know, this is another, just an example of how really careful information on, on both domains is important in your metadata. And again, and error propagation, you know, how, how certain are you in your measurements? Now, uh, the last thing I'll, that I'll mention is that even if we take example, uh, take um, a look at only the spatial reflectivity domain, there's, there's extra complexity that is normally, um, you know, ignored for standard image processing. 
So like we mentioned before, SAR images occur over some period of time called the CPI. Uh, you know, this might be tens of seconds, but it's built up with pulses and these pulses, you know, might be a hundred uh, microseconds, right? So um, the, the time scale is very different. And normally in SAR, we call this fast time and slow time, right? And generally speaking, you, you know, you have these two cardinal dimensions and KY, uh, so your, your Y axis is, is uh, generally aligned with your pulses and your KX, your horizontal axis is generally aligned with, with slow time, with, with um, kind of the pulses being built up over time. Um, you know, I, you normally are collecting an annulus, so that's not quite true, um, but, but to first order, right, that, that's what you see. And for certain applications, you need to be able to back out exactly what happened um, in fast time. And so, so here's an example. So um, on the left here, we see what's called high range resolution mode. And what this is, is this is trying to detect moving targets. And so in the center, we see this streak. And that streak is what's called the, the endoclutter region. That is the return uh, from objects that are located on the ground. And on the edges here, we see um, kind of these red boxes. These are detections over points. And those points are actually moving targets. And so, you know, SAR locates a, a point in space by that intersection, right, of the, of the ISO range sphere and the Dop ISO Doppler cone. Well, if an object is moving, it's, it's imparting motion. Uh, it, well, there's, I guess there's a fundamental assumption, right, that the scene is stationary and the sensor is moving. If that assumption is broken by an object moving, there's additional Doppler imparted to it. And that's what you're seeing here. These objects have, have additional Doppler shift and uh, you can detect it. Then uh, on the right here, you see vib vibrometry. And so basically here, there's a stationary truck, but the truck is running. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, panels are vibrating based on the motion of the engine. That's also something that you can detect. But both of these products require digging into, you know, what's happening in, um, in time during the course of the collection. And so the approximations that you utilize to, to get to a final image product, you want to be able to unpeel and get back to that raw time information. So, you know, what, what we're really looking at here is depending on the processing that you want to do, there's different amounts of, of encapsulation of complexity that are good or, or bad for your, F, for your uh, you know, your specific product, your algorithm. And so I have these listed here kind of in, in order of increasing um, complexity and, and decreased encapsulation. So if, if you just want to take a SAR image and you want to look at it with, you know, uh, with your human eye and, and um, see if something's happened, right? Is there a vehicle there? Is there not a vehicle there? Then you don't need to have a lot of information about the metadata. Um, but as you get more sophisticated, so for instance, you're, you're looking at um, registering a, a SAR image with, with other base information. Uh, an optical image or, or a base database of road uh, uh, roads from like open street maps, or if you're doing a product like the stereo SAR example that I showed earlier, you're going to know, have to know a little bit more about um, the, the spatial domain. If you're getting into coherent processing, you need to actually look as well at the metadata that's representing the spatial frequency domain. And then if you're going to the point of looking at moving targets or vibrometry, um, you you know, you might have to actually unpeel specifically how data was collected both across the CPI, across slow time, but also what changed in fast time. And so that's um, just an example of, of you know, how the, the metadata standard that we're developing should support encapsulation of this complexity, but also allowing a user to kind of peel off these layers and, um, if they need to, really get into the nitty gritty of how things were done. The last thing I'll mention is you have scenarios uh, that involve, um, you know, much more complex geometry. So here I'm showing a, a bisetic star image, and this was actually formed from mini RF on board the lunar, uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So a satellite orbiting the moon as the receiver, but then Arecibo was the transmitter. And so here you had kind of an extreme example of your transmit and receive apertures being separated. And um, we also support this type of geometry. Uh, now, currently P4002 doesn't support 
um, scenarios that move beyond this. So you you know you could certainly imagine a case where you had many transmitters, many receivers, and some type of MIMO situation. But we are supporting by static. Uh, that might be a you know a future follow-on for more sophisticated geometries. Um, the, the last thing that I'll mention before I get to questions is, you know, we're following a process where we, we really work on plain text. Um, all our technical content is in plain text. We've set, you know, this allows us to separate the technical content from any formatting. Um, it also lets us save that technical content in um, something like a Git repo, a source code repo. And it, it simplifies tracking and merging changes across different people working on the standard at the same time. Um, we're able to utilize a, a, a lot of tools that are developed for um, software and, and bring those right into the standards process. Um, we've also benefited from a number of open source tools and standards. Uh, so, you know, a few of those include Markdown, ASCII doc, Metanorma, and Plant UML. Um, Markdown was the markup language that we originally used. Uh, that's the language that's, that's used in, um, in GitHub, for example, for documentation. And we sub subsequently adopted this new metanorma tool, which is a standards authoring and publishing framework that provides an IEEE standards module. So it's been really helpful. I, I highly recommend it. Um, but metanorma uses a, a slightly different markup language, one called ASCII doc. And so we took our markdown and we converted it to ASCII doc, a, a pretty straightforward conversion because they're both ba based on plain text. There weren't a lot of changes in the, in the language features between the two, um, but we did that translation. And um, doing so, adopting ASCII doc and Metanorma also let us use plant UML to produce a UML version of the metadata standard. And so again, you know, we have our, our technical content is all in plain text, and we're able to use these tools to take it and, and produce formatted documents and formatted UMLs and, and easily track changes. So this has been a, a, you know, a pretty good process for us, something that I recommend um, certainly for adoption by other, other uh, efforts. And um, I, I think um, that concludes my content. I hope that gave you kind of an overview of, of our history, uh, what we're trying to achieve, and, um, and how we think it could be applied. OK, thank you very much. It's a very interesting and complete uh, presentation. So yes, as you say, this now is time for, for questions. So don't be shy. Go ahead, please. Someone have questions? So yeah. I, I do see one in, in the chat. Um, yes, maybe you can yeah, raise the hand and or yeah. Um so this I um I, I believe we do. Uh we, we are we are taking care of uh, calibration and validation information. Um and, and so that, that will be something that's included. I have a few questions, Richard, or comments. Uh, I would like that you have some minutes. I think that would be interesting for the audience if you can, can highlight what is really new in this standard as compared with previous standard by SEALs. What are the challenges that you have um, uh, found in this process? And thinking in the you know, implementation and the use of this nice standard, um, what are the communities that you think that can use this, this standard in the future? What are the users? Uh, oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so, so I think in terms of previous standards, you know, probably the biggest change uh, from COS is that one, it, it was somewhat incomplete. Um, I, I think all the groups that adopted it, you know, required uh, extensions to support specific things for their sensor platforms. And so you ended up with with um, products that followed a standard, um, but because of the of the add-ons, it, it was not quite you know the final product wasn't really fully standardized. Um, and, and the other thing is it it didn't support these more complicated modes, which is why you've seen uh, the, the larger international uh, systems, things like Terrasar, move away from from using that because. The, the, you, you can't encode things like this uh, scansar mode or some of these more complicated burst modes. And so that, I think that's really been um, the biggest limitation is we've um, seen kind of more, um, I don't want to call it esoteric, but, but more sophisticated uh, techniques. And as the sophistication of the imaging co and collection processes have changed, uh, 
you know, the standards don't support these new modes. Um, so the, the, the multi-burst, that's a big issue. Um, you know, if we look at SICID, the, the single look complex standard that's probably the most comprehensive, um, you know, it only supports three image formation modes. Uh, so, so range migration, uh, uh, polar format, PFA, um, and then uh, just uh, range azimuth uh, compression. And so, you know, that's limiting as well, right? The, the, um, th that's really works well for systems that, that focus on spotlight collects. Um, it has some support for strip map with, with the range um, migration, but, but it's limited. And, um, you know, back projection is a big thing now. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, sensors are doing back projection and projecting to a dim instead of, uh, so, so projecting to an image uh, surface that's, that follows a, a digital elevation model rather than a, a, a surface. And so none of those things are supported. Um, and so I think, you know, that's some of the big limitations. Great, great. I think that that's a great uh, job. So congratulations. And um, regarding oh, the final oh, user and communities that uh, yeah. are there. So, so in terms of users, you know, I, I think certainly we have kind of the, the earth science group doing interferometric and polarimetric processing um, from the, from these big like civil and, and um, commercial sensors. So things like Terrasar and Sentinel. Um, I, I think we'd also see anybody that's utilizing commercial data. Um, so the, 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 the spotlight collections from, from Umbra, Capella, ISI, um, so some of the other new, I, you know, I, I know I'm missing some of the new companies coming on board. Um, but, um, the, the folks that are looking at those products, often it'll be kind of a, a more niche application, uh, maybe for, um, it's so for, for like a commercial real estate developer or, um, people looking at where to put new road networks or looking at traffic. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think also you have bankers that are interested in counting semis and parking lots and distribution centers to try to understand how retail traffic is changing. You know, all of those things I think would be enabled by by this standard. Um, and then certainly I think all the uh, there's a lot of, of airborne sensors. So things like that mini star that I showed. Um, mm -hmm. So so users that are looking at those um, both for civil applications, um, you know, as, as well as um, maybe defense. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I, I guess I'll mention one other set of users. Uh, there might be some limited utility towards autonomous driving. You know, I, I think that some some of the SAR systems that people are looking at for for vehicle traffic might be. I, I probably depends on how they're set up. But, you know, if they're if they're a sophisticated MIMO, uh, that might be something that would require require an extension. Good. So we have time for a few more questions. So don't be shy. Please go ahead. You can raise the hand. I think there is one question here. Um, yeah, let's see. For users and consumers, um, could you share open source tools URLs? So I, I think that I would point you towards, um, on, on GitHub, um, there is a product called SARPI and uh, also the MATLAB SAR Toolkit. And so SARPI is written in Python. And then, you know, MATLAB SAR Toolkit is obviously written in, in MATLAB. Um, and, and those are, you know, two open source efforts. Uh, I, the ones I'm quite familiar with because they're they're developed by NGA as part of my portfolio there, um, but they provide the ability to to ingest uh, you know a variety of of SAR formats, in particular the MATLAB version. Um, we're we're expanding support in the Python. It's not quite uh, to the same level, but we hope to get there. Um, but you can ingest a wide variety of different sensors and then write out. Um, currently, SICID, and you know hopefully once uh, P four thousand two is further along, that's something we'd support more uh, readily there as well. Um, ah, yeah. So is there any materials in order to, so, so I, I, um, the question is, is there any materials in order to use SAR imagery for identification of agricultural practices, I guess, in particular, organic or conventional crops? Um, there, there certainly, uh, is a lot of application towards SAR, uh, for, uh, for, um, agriculture, right? I mean, Looking at at um, the stage of crop development, uh, at when a, a field has been harvested, and the density of, of foliage in a particular crop, 
Um, and, and this is an area where you'd probably use polymetric SAR. I don't know if there's any particular techniques that could differentiate between organic and conventional uh, production. I, I would not be surprised if there are. Um, you know, for instance, with a conventional, you know, maybe there's some more uniformity in the um, in the density of the crop. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure, but I, I think I think the answer is is likely yes. Um, all right. So then we have, we have another question: How can we track moving vehicles in real time using SAR images? Um, I guess the probably the, the catch there is is real time. Um, Normally, the, the way that our, these current SAR systems work is the data is collected and it, you know, it's collected over some period of time and then it's downlinked uh, and then further processed. And there's often uh, you know, a fairly high latency to that process, to, to the um, disseminating the data and then, then producing images. Um, you know, I, I don't know the exact latency, latency uh, timelines for things like the commercial systems. But I, um, I, I, you know, I, I expect that's probably in the order of, of hours. Um, and so that's, that's really isn't going to get you quite to the real time uh, domain. Now, if you have an airborne system, um, th then I think you could certainly achieve real time uh, tracking of moving targets. And so, you know, how that's done in particular, it's, it, it, the, the processing is pretty straightforward. If you're just trying to detect um, a, a SAR image, you often can can do a, a spotlight collection and then just do a 2D FFT, so a really crude approximation of, of an image former, and then then uh, do an amplitude detect and get a get a uh, you know kind of fact of a, a vehicle there. Um, so, so anyway, you just do that real time on the on the aircraft and then transmit your detections. Um, so let's see the the next question, are there any set of guidelines for using SAR images to monitor deformations, uh, deformation on the land? Um, I, I believe the answer is yes. Um, I'm not heavily involved in the differential interferometric community uh, at, at the moment. Um, that's something I, you know, I, I certainly looked at in grad school, um, but there's a, a wide variety of literature. And so I, I think if you're interested in, in measuring uh, deformation, you know, really looking at the open literature on uh, differential interferometric uh, SAR, so DIN SAR, uh, I, you know, I'd recommend that. And there's, there's some fantastic um, papers that kind of cover, cover that, that process. It, you know, it's a, a very rich literature. Uh, so let's see, for the, the SAR data required for tracking moving targets, I, I think I covered that a, a, a minute ago, but you're really looking at um, very short collections, like short, C, uh, sh short uh, coherent processing intervals. And so you might be only integrating for you know, a tenth of a second, uh, you form a 2D FFT, and then then you um, you just do an amplitude detect. And so it's uh, generally um, that would be a spotlight collect, and then uh, with with a, with a, a fast Fourier transform. All right, and so finally we have: Does uh, the standard allow encapsulation of complexity about high resolution wide swath systems? Um, you know, I believe the the answer that would be ho hopefully I, I, that's that's certainly something we're trying to achieve. Um, what are the next challenges of the working group to meet the needs for next generation systems, uh, digital beam forming, and so on? Um, so we are really trying to to find a a good balance um, between having uh, things in the standard that are too specific, uh, really getting too far into the weeds on a on a specific implementation of a sensor um, versus, um, you know, too simplistic to be useful to a, to an end user. And so hopefully we're, we're getting that balance correct, but, um, tracking, um, you know, the, the, uh, beam forming over time is certainly something that we're, we're trying to inc incorporate. Um, I think that one of the, uh, the challenges that might, um, or things that we, we might need to look at next, in particular, um, with regard to that uh, process, is, is looking at other data layers. If you're really needing to get into uh, specifics of digital beamforming, you might want to, instead of looking at the single look complex, kind of the formed image, you might want to go back an additional layer to what would be covered um, by like the NGA co uh, compensated face history data standard. So the, the 
face history layer. And that's, that's not something that's covered by this P4002 effort. Um, I, you know, I, I have a feeling that that is something that would be looked at in the future um, by this community. And let's see what, uh, uh, another question here, what open source software provides good uh, capability of processing SAR data? Um, so, so I think I mentioned, you know, two that, that I work with, uh, SARPy and the MATLAB SAR toolbox, those are both available on, on GitHub. Um, and th that provides some capability. I, I guess the question is, you know, what amount of processing are you trying to do? Or if you want to go from, uh, from a face history to a formed image, uh, you know, including image formation, it probably depends on, um, you know, the, the specifics of the image formation that you're trying to do, right? Is it polar format? Is it strip map? Uh, what's the source of the data? And I, I know that uh, MATLAB Star Toolbox, in, in, you know, includes a, uh, a polar format code. There is open source polar format code that's available in a journal article um, from uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, I think they also provide back projection. Um, so, so those are certainly open source image formation tools that are out there. I don't know. I, I'm sure there are more, but I, I'm not familiar with them. And then, um, let's see, another question here. Would you please introduce a software for processing SAR images except SARScape and SNAP? Um, you know, so, so I think, I, you know, I apologize. I think other than the ones I mentioned, I'm, I'm not familiar. I, I know that there are more, um, but, but those are the ones that I'm familiar with. Okay, I think it was an excellent talk. Uh, we we are running out of time, so we have time for one last question or comment by your side. Okay, I, if we have more questions, I, I, I guess. guess in the the absence of, of questions, there's there's one last uh, thing I'd like to mention, and and that is, um, you know, we're we're getting fairly close to uh, to submitting a final draft. Um, but we are, we're certainly interested in more people participating, uh, you know, and so if anybody's interested, I really encourage them to, to contact me and we'd, we'd love to welcome you in, the, in this group. And I'm sure that we'll have a lot more uh, efforts even after that draft is submitted. And so, um, you know, always welcome more, uh, more interested parties. Okay, so congrats, Richard, and uh, see you soon. Thank you to all. all right. of Thank you. Ciao.